The Glass Castle, pages 94 to 109. When we pulled up in front of the house on North 3rd Street, I could not believe we were actually going to live there. It was a mansion, practically so big that Grandma Smith had had two families living in it, both paying her rent. We had the entire place to ourselves. Mom said it had been built almost a 100 years ago as a fort. These outside walls, covered with white stucco, were three feet thick. These sure would stop any Indians' arrows, I said to Brian. We kids ran through the house and counted 14 rooms, including the kitchens and bathrooms. They were filled with things Mom had inherited from Grandma Smith. A dark Spanish dining table with eight matching chairs, a hand-carved upright piano, sideboards with antique silver serving sets, and glass-fronted cabinets filled with Grandma's bone china, which Mom demonstrated was the finest quality by holding a plate up to the light and showing us at the clear silhouette of her hand through it. The front yard had a palm tree, and the backyard had orange trees that grew real oranges. We'd never lived in a house with trees. I particularly loved the palm tree, which made me think that I had arrived at some kind of oasis. There were also hollyhocks and oleander bushes with pink and white flowers. Behind the yard was a shed as big as some of the houses we had lived in, and next to the shed were, was a parking space big enough for two cars. We were definitely moving up in the world. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. The people living on North 3rd Street were mostly Mexicans and Indians who had moved into the neighborhood after the whites left for the suburbs and subdivided the big old houses into apartments. There seemed to be a couple of dozen people in each house, men drinking beers from paper bags, young mothers nursing babies, old ladies sunning themselves on the sagging, weathered porches, and hordes of kids. All the kids around North 3rd Street went to a Catholic school at St. Mary's Church, about five blocks away. Mom, however, said the nuns were killjoys, who took the fun out of religion. She wanted us to go to public school called Emerson. Although we lived outside the district, Mom begged and cajoled the principal until he allowed us to enroll. We were not on the bus route, and it was a bit of a hike to school, but none of us minded the walk. Emerson was in a fancy neighborhood with street canopied by eucalyptus trees, and the school building looked like a Spanish hacienda with the red terracotta roof. It was surrounded by palm trees and banana trees, and when the bananas ripened, the students all got free bananas at lunch. The playground at Emerson was covered with lush green grass, watered by a sprinkler system, and it had more equipment than I'd ever seen. Seesaws, swings, a merry-go-round, jungle gym, tether balls, and a running track. Miss Shaw, the teacher in the third grade class I was assigned to, had steely gray hair and a pointy rimmed glasses and a stern mouth. When I told her I had read all the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, she raised her eyes skeptically, but after I read aloud from one of them, she moved me into a reading group for gifted children. Lori's and Brian's teachers also put them in gifted reading groups. Brian hated it because the other kids were older and he was the littlest guy in the class. But Lori and I were secretly thrilled to be called special. Instead of letting on that we felt that way, however, we made light of it. When we told mom and dad about our reading groups, we paused before the word gifted, clasping our hands beneath our chins, fluttering our eyelids, and pretending to look angelic. Don't make a mockery of it, dad said. Of course you're special. Haven't I always told you that? Brian gave Dad a sideways look. If we're so special, he said slowly, why don't you... He, his words pet petered out. What? Dad asked. What? Brian shook his head. Nothing, he said. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Emerson had its very own nurse who gave the three of us ear and eye exams, our first ever. I aced the test. Eagle eyes and elephant ears, the nurse said. But Lori struggled trying to read the eye chart. The nurse declared her eyes severely short-sighted and sent Mom a note saying she needed glasses. No siree, Mom said. She didn't approve of glasses. If you had weak eyes, Mom believed they needed exercise to get strong. The way she saw it, glasses were like crutches. They prevented people with feeble eyes from learning to see the world on their own. She said people had been trying to get her to wear glasses for years and she had refused. But the nurse sent another note saying Lori couldn't attend Emerson unless she wore glasses and the school would pay for them, so Mom gave in. When the glasses were ready, we all went down to the optometrist. The lenses were so thick they made Lori's eyes look like look big and bugged out, like fish eyes. She kept swiveling her head around and up and down. What's the matter? I asked. Instead of answering, Lori ran outside. I followed her. She was standing in the parking lot, gazing in awe at the trees, the houses, and the office buildings behind them. You see that tree over there? She said, pointing at a sycamore about a 100 feet away. I nodded. 
I can not only see that tree, I can see the individual leaves on it. She looked at me triumphantly. Can you see them? I nodded. She didn't seem to believe me. The individual leaves? I mean, not just the branches, but each little leaf? I nodded. Lori looked at me and then burst into tears. On the way home, she kept seeing the, for the first time all these things that most everyone else had stopped noticing because they'd seen them every day. She read street signs and billboards aloud. She pointed out starlings perched on the telephone wires. We went into a bank and she stared up at the vaulted ceiling and described the octagonal patterns. At home, Lori insisted that I try on her glasses. They would blur my vision as much as they corrected hers, she said, so I'd be able to see things the way she always had. I put on the glasses and the world dissolved into fuzzy, blotchy shapes. I took a few steps and banged my shin on the coffee table and then realized why Lori didn't like going exploring as much as Brian and I. She couldn't see. Lori wanted Mom to try on the glasses too. Mom slipped them on and blinking looked around the room. She studied one of her own paintings quietly, then handed the glasses back to Lori. Did you see better? I asked. I wouldn't say better, Mom answered. I'd say different. Maybe you should get a pair, Mom. I like the world just fine the way I see it, she said. But Lori loved seeing the world clearly. She started compulsively drawing and painting all the wondrous things she was discovering. Like the way each curved tile on Emerson's roof cast its own curved shadow on the tile below. And the way the setting sun painted the underbellies of the clouds pink but left the piled up tops purple. Not long after Lori got glasses, she decided she wanted to be an artist, like Mom. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. As soon as we'd settled into the house, Mom threw herself into her art career. She erected a big white sign in the front yard on which she had carefully painted in black letters with gold outlines, R.M. Walls Art Studio. She turned the two front rooms of the house into a studio and gallery, and she used two bedrooms in the back to warehouse her collected works. An art supply store was three blocks away on North 1st Street, and thanks to Mom's inheritance, we were able to make regular shopping expeditions to the store, bringing home rolls of canvas that Dad stretched and stapled onto wooden frames. We also brought back oil paints, watercolors, acrylics, gesso, a silk screening frame, India paint, paintbrushes, and pen nibs, charcoal pencils, pastels, fancy rag paper for pastel drawings, and even a wooden mannequin with movable joints whom we named Edward and who, Mom said, would pose for her when we kids were off at school. Mom decided that before she could get down to any serious painting, she needed to compile a thorough art reference library. She bought dozens of big loose leaf binders and lots of packs of lined paper. Every subject was given its own binder, dogs, cats, horses, farm animals, woodland animals, flowers, fruits, and vegetables, rural landscapes, urban landscapes, men's faces, women's faces, men's bodies, women's bodies, and hands, feet, bottoms, and other miscellaneous body parts. We spent hours and hours going through old magazines looking for interesting pictures, and when we spotted one we thought might be a worthy subject of a painting, we held it up to mom for approval. She studied it for a second and okayed it or nixed it. If the photo made the grade, we cut it out, glued it on a piece of lined paper, and reinforced the holes in the paper with adhesive O's so that the page wouldn't tear out. Then we got the appropriate three-ringed binder, added the new photograph, and snapped the ring shut. In exchange for our help with our reference library, Mom gave us all art lessons. Mom was also hard at work on her writing. She bought several typewriters, manuals, and electrics, so she'd have backups should her favorite break down. She kept them in her studio. She never sold anything she wrote, but from time to time, she received an encouraging rejection letter, and she thumbtacked those to the wall. When we kids came home from school, she'd usually be in her studio working. If it was quiet, she was painting or contemplating potential subjects. If the typewriter keys were clattering away, she was at work on one of her novels, poems, plays, short stories, or her illustrated collection of pithy sayings. One was, Life is a Bowl of Cherries, with a few nuts thrown in, which she titled R.M. Wall's Philosophy of Life. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Dad joined the local electrician's union. Phoenix was booming and he landed a job pretty quickly. He left the house in the morning wearing a yellow hard hat and big steel-toed boots, which I thought made him look extra handsome. Because of the union, he was making steadier money than we'd ever seen. On his first payday, he came home and called us all into the living room. We kids had left our toys out in the yard, he declared. 
No, sir, we didn't, I said. I think you did, he said. Go out and take a look. We ran to the front door. Outside in the yard, parked in a row, were three brand new bicycles. A big red one and two smaller ones, a blue boy's bike and a purple girl's bike. I thought at first that some other kids must have left them there. When Lori pointed out that Dad had obviously bought them for us, I didn't believe her. We had never had bicycles. We had learned to ride on other kids' bikes, and it had never occurred to me that one day I might actually own one myself, especially a new one. I turned around. Dad was standing in the door with his arms crossed and a sly grin on his face. Those bikes aren't for us, are they? I asked. Well, they're too damn small for your mother and me, he said. Lori and Brian had climbed on their bikes and were riding up and down the sidewalk. I stared at mine. It was shiny purple and had white banana seat, wire baskets on the side, chrome handlebars that swept out like steer horns, and white plastic handles with purple and silver tassels. Dad knelt beside me. Like it? he asked. I nodded. You know, Mountain Goat, I still feel bad about making you leave your rock collection back in Battle Mountain, he said, but we had to travel light. I know, I said. It was more than one thing, anyway. I'm not so sure, Dad said. Every damn thing in the universe can be broken down into smaller things, even atoms, even protons. So theoretically speaking, I guess you had a winning case. A collection of things should be considered one thing. Unfortunately, theory don't always carry the day. We rode our bicycles everywhere. Sometimes we attached playing cards to the forks with clothespins, so they flapped against the spokes when the wheels turned. Now that Lori could see, she was the navigator. She got a city map from a gas station and plotted out our routes in advance. We pedaled past the Westward Ho Hotel down Central Avenue, where square-faced Indian women sold beaded necklaces and moccasins on rainbow-colored serapes they'd spread on the sidewalk. We'd pedal to Woolworth's, which was bigger than all the stores in Battle Mountain put together, and played tag in the aisles until the manager chased us out. We got Grandma Smith's old wooden tennis rackets and pedaled off to Phoenix University, where we tried to play tennis with the dead balls other people had left behind. We pedaled to the Civic Center, which had a library where librarians recognized us because we went there so much. They helped us find books they thought we'd like, and we filled up our wire baskets on our bicycles and pedaled home right down the middle of the sidewalks, as if we owned the place. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Since mom and dad had all this money, we got our own telephone. We had never owned a telephone before, and whenever it rang, we kids all scrambled for it. Whoever got there first summoned up a super snooty English accent. Walls, residents, the butler speaking, may I help you? While the rest of us cracked up. We also had a big record player in a wooden cabinet that had been grandma's. You could put a stack of records on it, and when one was finished playing, the needle arm automatically swung out, and the next record dropped down with a happy slap. Mom and Dad loved music, especially rousing stuff that made you want to get up and dance, or at least sway your head or tap your foot. Mom was always going to the thrift stores and coming back with old albums of polka music, Negro spirituals, German marching bands, Italian operas, and cattle roundup songs. She also bought boxes of used high heels that she called her dancing shoes. She'd slip on a pair of dancing shoes, put a stack of records on the phonograph, and crank the volume way up. Dad danced with her if he was there. Otherwise, she'd dance alone, waltzing or jitterbugging or doing the Texas two-step from room to room. The house filled with the sounds of Mario Lanza or impawing tubas or some mournful cowboy singing the streets of Laredo. Mom and Dad also bought an electric washing machine that we kept out on the patio. It was white enamel tub up on legs, and we filled it with water from the garden hose. A big agitator twisted back and forth, making the entire machine dance around on the cement patio. It had no cycles, so you waited until the water got dirty, then put the clothes through the wringer. Two rubber rolling pins rigged above the tub that were turned by a motor. To rinse the clothes, you repeat the process without soap, then let the water drain into the yard to help the grass grow. Despite our wondrous appliances, life in Phoenix wasn't total luxury. We had about a gazillion cockroaches, big, strong things with shiny wings. We had just a few at first, but since Mom was not exactly a compulsive cleaner, they multiplied. After a while, entire armies were scuttling across the walls and the floors and the kitchen counters. In Battle Mountain, we had lizards to eat the flies and cats to eat the lizards. We couldn't think of any animal that liked to eat roaches, so I suggested we buy roach spray, like all the neighbors did. But mom was opposed to chemical warfare. 
It was like those shell no pest strips, she said. We'd end up poisoning ourselves, too. Mom decided hand-to-hand -hand combat was the best tactic. We conducted roach massacres in the kitchen at night because that was when they came out in full force. We armed ourselves with rolled-up magazines or shoes. Even though I was only nine, I had already wore size 10 shoes that Brian called roach killers and sneaked into the kitchen. Mom threw the light switch and we kids all started the assault. You didn't even have to aim. We had so many roaches that if you hit any flat surface, you were sure to take out at least a few. The house also had termites. We discovered this a few months after we moved in, when Lori's foot crashed through the spongy wood floor in the living room. After inspecting the house, Dad decided that the termite infestation was so severe nothing could be done about it. We'd have to coexist with the critters, so we walked around the hole in the living room floor. But the wood was chewed through everywhere. We kept stepping on soft spots in the floorboard boards, crashing through and creating new holes. Damned if this floor isn't starting to look like a piece of Swiss cheese, Dad said one day. He told me to fetch him his wire cutters, a hammer, and some roofing nails. He finished off the beer he was drinking, snipped the can open with his wire cutters, hammered it flat, and nailed it over the hole. He needed more patches, he said, so he had to go out and buy another six-pack. After he polished off each beer, he used the can to repair one of the holes, and whenever a new hole appeared, he'd get out his hammer, down a beer, and do another patch job. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. A lot of our neighbors on North 3rd Street were kind of weird. A clan of gypsies lived down the block in big falling apart house with plywood nailed over the porch to create more indoor space. They were always stealing our stuff, and one time after Brian's pogo stick had disappeared, he saw one of the old gypsy women bouncing down the sidewalk on it. She wouldn't give it back, so mom got into a big argument with the head of the clan, and the next day we found a chicken with its throat cut out on our doorstep. It was some kind of gypsy hex. Mom decided, as she put it, to fight magic with magic. She took a ham bone out of the beans and went down to the gypsy's house, waving it in the air. Standing on the sidewalk, she held up the bone like at a crucifix at an exorcism and called down a curse on the entire gypsy clan and their house, vowing it would collapse with the lot of them in it and the bowels of the earth would open up and swallow them forever if they bothered us again. The next morning, Brian's pogo stick was lying in the front yard. The neighborhood also had its share of perverts. Mostly, there were shabby, hunched men in the wielding voices who hung around on street corners and followed us to and from school, trying to give us boosts when we climbed a fence, offering us candy and loose change if we would go play with them. We called them creeps and hollered at them to leave us alone, but I worried about hurting their feelings because I couldn't help wondering if maybe they were telling the truth and that all they wanted was to be our friends. At night, Mom and Dad always left the front door and the back door and all the windows open. Since we had no air conditioning, they explained we needed to let the air circulate. From time to time, a vagrant or wino would wander through the front door, assuming the house was deserted. When we woke up in the morning, we'd find one asleep in the front room. As soon as we roused them, they shambled off apologetically. Mom always assured us that they were just harmless drunks. Maureen, who was four and had terrible fear of boogeymen, kept dreaming that intruders in Halloween masks were coming through the open doors to get us. One night, when I was almost 10, I was awakened by someone running his hands over my private parts. At first, it was confusing. Lori and I slept in the same bed, and I thought maybe she was moving in her sleep. I groggily pushed the hand away. I just want to play a game with you, a man's voice said. I recognized the voice. It belonged to a scraggly guy with sunken cheeks who had been hanging around North 3rd Street recently. He tried to walk us home from school and had given Brian a magazine called Kids on a Farm with pictures of girls and boys wearing only underpants. Pervert! I yelled and kicked at the man's hand. Brian came running into the room with a hatchet he kept by his bed, and the man bolted out the door. Dad was out that night, and when Mom slept, she was dead to the world, so Brian and I ran after the man ourselves. As we got to the sidewalk, lit by the purplish glow from the streetlights, he disappeared around the corner. We searched for him for a few blocks, Brian whacking at the bushes with his hatchet, but we couldn't find him. On our way home, we were slapping each other's hands and pumping our fists in the air as if we'd won a boxing match. We decided we had been pervert hunting, which was like the demon hunting, except the enemy was real and dangerous, instead of being the product of a kid's overactive imagination. The next day, when Dad came home and we told him about what happened, he said he was going to kill that low-life son of a bitch. He and Brian and I went on a serious pervert hunt. Our blood up. We searched the streets for hours, but we never did find the guy. I asked Mom and Dad if we should close the doors and the windows when we went to sleep. They wouldn't consider it. We needed the fresh air, they said, and it was essential that we refuse to surrender to fear. 
so the windows stayed open. Maureen kept having nightmares of men in Halloween masks, and every now and then, when Brian and I were feeling revved up, he'd get a machete and I'd get a baseball bat, and we'd go pervert hunting, clearing the streets of the creeps who preyed on kids. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. Mom and Dad like to make a big point about never surrendering to fear or to prejudice or to the narrow-minded conformist stick in the mud who tried to tell everyone else what was proper. We were supposed to ignore those benighted sheep, as Dad called them. One day, Mom went with us kids to the library at the Civic Center. Since the weather was sweltering, she suggested we cool off by jumping into the fountain in front of the building. The water was too shallow to swim in, but we paddled around pretending to be crocodiles until we attracted a small group of people who kept insisting to Mom that swimming was forbidden in the fountain. Mind your own beeswax, Mom replied. I was feeling kind of embarrassed and started to climb out. Ignore the fuddy-duddies, Mom told me, and to make it clear she paid no never mind to such people or their opinions, she clambered into the fountain and plopped down besides us, sending gallons of water slooshing over the sides. It never bothered Mom if people turned and stared at her, even in church, although she thought nuns were killjoys and she didn't follow all the church's rules word for word. She treated the Ten Commandments more like the Ten Suggestions. Mom considered herself a devout Catholic and took us to Mass most Sundays. St. Mary's was the biggest and most beautiful church I had ever seen. It was made of sand-colored adobe and had two soaring steeples, a gigantic circular stained glass window, and, leaping up the two main doors, a pair of sweeping staircases covered with pigeons. The other mothers dressed up for mass, wearing black lace mantillas on their heads and clutching green or red or yellow handbags that matched their shoes. Mom thought it was superficial to worry about how you looked. She said God thought the same way, so she'd go to church in torn or paint-splattered clothes. It was your inner spirit and not your outward appearance that mattered, she said. And come hymn time, she showed the whole congregation her spirit, felting out the words in such a powerful voice that people in the pews in front of us would turn around and stare. Church was a particularly excruciating when Dad came along. And Dad had been raised a Baptist, but he didn't like religion and he didn't believe in God. He believed in science and reason, he said, not superstition and voodoo. But Mom had refused to have children unless Dad agreed to raise them as Catholics and to attend church himself on holy days of obligation. Dad sat in a pew, fuming and shifting around and trying to bite his tongue while the priest carried on about Jesus resurrecting Lazarus from the dead and the communicants filled up to eat the body and to drink the blood of Christ. Finally, when Dad was unable to stand it any longer, he'd shout out something to challenge the priest. He didn't do it to be hostile. He hollered out his point in a friendly tone. Yo, Padre, he say. The priest usually ignored Dad and tried to go on with his sermon, but Dad persisted. He'd challenge the priest about scientific impossibility of the miracles. And when the priest continued to ignore him, he'd get mad and yell out something about Pope Alexander's six bastard children, or Pope Leo's tense hedonism, or Pope Nicholas III's simony, or the murders committed in the name of the church during the Spanish Inquisition. But what could you expect, he'd say, from an institution run by celibate men who wore dresses? And at that point, the ushers would tell us we'd have to leave. Don't worry, God understands, Mom said. He knows that your father is a cross we must bear. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide. City life was getting to Dad. I'm starting to feel like a rat in a maze, he told me. He hated the way everything in Phoenix was so organized, with time cards, bank accounts, telephone bills, parking meters, tax forms, alarm clocks, PTA meetings, and pollsters knocking on the door and prying into your affairs. He hated all the people who lived in air-conditioned houses with the windows permanently sealed and drove air-conditioned cars to nine-to-five jobs in air-conditioned office buildings that he said were a little bit more than gussy up prisons. Just the sight of those people on their way to work made him feel hemmed in and itchy. He began complaining that we were all getting too soft, too dependent on creature comforts, and that we were losing touch with the natural world of order. Dad missed the wilderness. He needed to be roaming free in open country and living among untamed animals. He felt it was good for your soul to have buzzards and coyotes and snakes around. That was the way man was meant to live, he'd say, in harmony with the wild, like the Indians, not this lords of the earth crap, trying to rule the entire goddamn planet, cutting down all the forests and killing every creature you couldn't bring to heal. 
One day, we heard on the radio that a woman in the suburbs had seen a mountain lion behind her house and had called the police, who shot the animal. Dad got so angry, he put his fist through the wall. That mountain lion had as much of right to his life as that sour old biddy does to hers, he'd said. You can't kill something just because it's wild. Dad stewed for a while, sucking on a beer, and then told us to all get in the car. Where are we going? I asked. We hadn't been on a single expedition since we moved to Phoenix. I miss them. I'm going to show you, he said, that no animal, no matter how big or wild, is dangerous as long as you know what you're doing. We all piled into the car. Dad drove, nursing another beer and cussing under his breath about an innocent mountain lion and the chicken shit suburbanite. We turned in at the city zoo. None of us kids have ever been to a zoo before, and I really didn't know what to expect. Lori said she thought zoos should be outlawed. Mom, who had Marine in one arm and her sketch pad in another, pointed out that the animals had traded freedom for security. She said that when she looked at them, she would pretend not to see the bars. At the entrance gate, Dad bought our tickets, muttering about the idiocy of paying money to look at animals, and led us down the walk. Most of the cages were patches of dirt surrounded by iron bars with forlorn gorillas or restless bears or irritable monkeys or anxious gazelles huddled in the corners. A lot of the kids were having fun, gawking and laughing and throwing peanuts at the animals. But the sight of those poor creatures made my throat swell up. I've got half a mind to sneak in here some night and free these creatures, Dad said. Can I help? I asked. He muzzied my hair. Me and you, Mountain Goat, he said, we'll carry out our own animal prison break. We stopped at a bridge. Below it, in a deep pit, alligators sunned themselves on rocks surrounding a pond. The biddy who got that mountain lion shot didn't understand animal psychology, Dad said. If you let them know you're not afraid, they'll leave you alone. Dad pointed to the biggest, scaliest alligator. Me and that nasty-looking bastard's going to have us a staring contest. Dad stood on the bridge, glowering at the alligator. At first, it seemed to be asleep, but then it blinked and looked up to Dad. Dad continued staring, his eyes in a fierce squint. After a minute, the alligator thrashed its tail, looked away, and slid into the water. See, you just have to communicate your position, Dad said. Maybe he would have gone for a swim anyway, Brian whispered. What do you mean, I asked. Didn't you see how nervous the gator got? Dad made him do it. We followed Dad to the lion's den, but the lions were sleeping, so Dad said we should leave them alone. The aardvark was busy hoovering up ants, and Dad said you shouldn't disturb eating animals, so we passed it by and went to the cheetah's cage which is about as big as our living room and surrounded by a chain fence. The lone cheetah paced back and forth, the muscles in his shoulders shifting with each step. Dad folded his arms on his chest and studied the cheetah. He's a good animal. Fastest four-footed creature on the planet, he declared. Not happy about being in this damn cage, but he's resigned to it, and he's no longer angry. Let's see if he's hungry. Dad took me to the concession stand. He told the lady running it that he had a rare medical condition and couldn't eat cooked meat, so he'd like to buy a raw hamburger. Yeah, right, the sales clerk said. She told Dad the zoo did not allow the sale of uncooked meat because foolish people tried to feed it to the animals. I'd like to feed her lard ass to the animals, Dad muttered. He bought me a bag of popcorn and returned to the cheetah cage. Dad squinted outside the fence opposite the cheetah. The animal came closer to the bars and studied him curiously. Dad kept looking at him, but not in the angry-eyed way he had stared down the alligator. The cheetah looked back. Finally, he sat down. Dad stepped over the chain fence and knelt right next to the bars where the cheetah was sitting. The cheetah remained still, looking at Dad. Dad slowly raised his right hand and put it up against the cage. The cheetah looked at Dad's hand, but didn't move. Dad calmly put his hand between the iron bars of the cage and rested it on the cheetah's neck. The cheetah moved the side of his face against Dan's hand, as if asking to be petted. Dad gave the cheetah the kind of hearty, vigorous petting you'd give a dog. Situation under control, Dad said and beckoned over us. We climbed under the chain fence and knelt around Dad while he petted the cheetah. By then, a few people had begun to gather. One man was calling to us to get back behind the chain fence. We ignored him. I knelt close to the cheetah. My heart was beating fast, but I wasn't scared, only excited. I could feel the cheetah's hot breath on my face. He looked right at me. His amber eyes were steady but sad, as if he knew he'd never seen the plains of Africa again. May I pet him, please? I asked Dad. Dad took my hand and slowly guided it to the side of the cheetah's neck. It was soft but also bristly. The cheetah turned his head and put his moist nose up against my hand. Then his big pink tongue unfolded from his mouth and he licked my hand. I gasped. Dad opened my hand and held my fingers back. The cheetah licked my palm, his tongue warm and rough like sandpaper dipped in hot water. 
I felt all tingly. I think he likes me, I said. He does, Dad said. He also likes the popcorn, salt, and butter on your hand. There was a small crowd around the cage now, and one particularly frantic woman grabbed my shirt and tried to pull me over the chain. It's all right, I told her. My dad does stuff like this all the time. He should be arrested, she shouted. Okay, kids, Dad said. The civilians are revolting. You better skedaddle. We climbed over the chain. When I looked back, the cheetah was following us along the side of the cage. Before we could make our way through the crowd, a heavy man in a navy blue uniform came running towards us. He was holding on to the gun and a nightstick on his belt, which made him look like he was running with his hands on his hips. He was shouting about regulations and how idiots had been killed climbing into cages and how we had all had to leave immediately. He grabbed Dad by the shoulder, but Dad pushed him off and assumed a fighting stance. Some of the men in the crowd clutched Dad's arms, and Mom asked Dad to please do what the guard had ordered. Dad nodded and held out his hands in a peace gesture. He led us through the crowd and toward the exit, chuckling and shaking his head to let us kids know that these fools were not worth the time it would take to kick their butts. I could hear people around us whispering about the crazy drunk man and his dirty little urchin children, but who cared what they thought? None of them had ever had their hand licked by a cheetah. Pause here and make an annotation using your annotation guide.